Good to talk to you today. And uh, you. Steve, yeah, thank you. It's Steve Longo talking about John Entwistle, Rarities Oxumed, Volume 1. It's been out now for a little over a month. October 21st was the official uh, release date, as we're talking here in December 2nd. Um, reaction thus far since it's been released of, of John Entwistle fans, fans of the, of the John Entwistle band, et cetera, et cetera, your followers, what, what feedback have you, been, have you been hearing? I, um, I've been getting nothing but great feedback, which is amazing. I, I don't, I'm a little wary of feedback because it can, it can hurt your feelings sometimes. But, um, in this case, this really had nothing to do with me as more, it had more to do with the fans and the offering of the insight. Um, I mean, the short story is people have loved it and embraced it. And whenever I make a record, I wind up you know, over analyzing everything. And, and, uh, this time I didn't have the voice of reason that is John Entwistle saying, no, no, it's fine. Um, but I maybe in the back of my head, I heard it a little bit. So I, I'm happy to report that everything's been positive. Good. Is there any track that's jumping out or tracks that people have really gone? Whoa, wow. I didn't know this was coming surprised at anything in that regard. Um, no, I haven't, I haven't heard anybody pick anything out. They've, um, they kind of referenced the, the three different areas that the album covers, the studio tracks, the, um, which are usually alternate versions or remixes, the demos, which are just, you know, meant to be demonstrators for somebody else to do the material. So the quality of those isn't particularly stellar. And then the live stuff and they, I love the studio, love love the demos, love the live tracks. That's nobody's really picked anything out. I and mean, a couple of friends have said, "Oh wow, the solo in Shaking All Over," or the bass part in um, uh, "Try Again Today" because he does, um, you know. It, but it's 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 been positive. It hasn't been specific yet, but we'll give people a little time. It's a lot to digest, I guess, maybe. Well, and this is volume one, and, and you reassured there's going to be a, a volume two, et cetera. Why these particular tracks in the three categories? Why these for the first round? Very good question. Um, I like to think I have a very good answer. <laughs> it, it's, it's studio tracks. I think the first, I should probably have one in front of me so I could really refer to it. But it's here's one. Here's one right here. <laughs> it's uh let's see the first one two three four five six seven the first eight songs are studio recordings and why i picked these particular ones there's one um well these are different versions of things that we use and i'll give you the story behind the recorded stuff when when we decided that we wanted and this is john and i decided that we wanted to start writing together and pursue a deal for the band rather than just going out and playing we wrote songs together that we thought would represent the band on a demo and one of those songs was i wouldn't sleep with you and then left for dead was all the version that's on this album is was also on there and i forget what the other two were but um maybe sucker uh no no, no we wrote that for the job anyway i'm getting all off the off the track <laughs> we um we wrote the four songs, uh, including Left for Dead, because that was the name of our tour. Our first tour was Left for Dead, um, because John and I used to joke that we'd been left for dead by our bands. <laughs> so, send the buzzard became our logo to get him away from the spider. But anyway, so we go. To, I go to the States with the demos, and my business manager winds up uh, getting us a deal with uh, a a Fox Warner Brothers kids show called Vampires. Mm -hmm. um, and basically it's it's a kids show. It's an amazing show. The, the actors, there were, it was called Anim Action and it was half uh, live actors and half uh, CGI. Anyway, they said, well, this is great. We This is the sound we want for the show, but I wouldn't sleep with you. It's probably not going to fly on a kids program. <laughs> and <laughs> and left for dead the version that you have or that we now have out 
um, wasn't going to fly either because there couldn't be any weapons. There couldn't be any, um, you know, death. There couldn't be any, um, no sex, no drugs, uh, no, ne you know, no negativity. Well, so if you listen to Left for Dead, it's a, a spy who who dies. It's, a, it's a, um, <laughs> Magnificent Seven. Yeah, like that. Cowboy who dies, right. And then the, the husband that dies. So, um, so those were, were never used and no one would ever hear those under, under any other circumstances. So that was a no brainer. I mean, the, the idea is to share something that hasn't been out there or to share something that gives you a unique glimpse at some, you know, at something else. It's, it, those were no brainers back on the road, which is also studio track was a no brainer because, um, it, the lyrics more so than the I mean, it's a great song and and the basic tracks were recorded in the 70s and then we finished them in the 90s um i wasn't there for the basics um it was john and kenny jones i think uh john was playing piano and uh kenny played drums and john played the bass and sang the parts but it was never completed because it was meant to be a demo so um when we finished it i thought i have to include that because the story of it is so John Entwistle. I got to get back out on the road. Life is like a heavy load around my neck when I can't hit the deck. Um, and, you know, no audience applause. They can't see through walls. It's all just so telling about who John was. I mean, he was, you know, if it was 400 years ago, he was a traveling minstrel. That's He loved to play for people. So I thought, you know, that too was a no-brainer. Bogeyman, if you're going to, Release a, <laughs> release a John Entwistle album. It always helps to have Keith Moon on it, right? So, um, and again, that was Keith on drums. I actually, John had me replace Kenny's drums on Back on the Road. So that's me playing um, exactly what Kenny played because the reverb, uh, the track bled into the vocal. So I had to match his fills. But um, Bogeyman, you you know, you're not replacing Keith Moon, and he just played so well. And I remember saying to John when he played me the demo, it was just him playing bass and and uh, the drums and the vocal track. And I said, "Who's playing drums?" And he said, "I don't, I don't know." And I said, "Well, it sounds like Mooney." And he goes, "Oh yeah, it's him." Like, <laughs> oh, okay. you know, maybe we should use this. You think we could finish it? Put I'll put guitars and we'll do you know synthesize. And so that's how that one got on there. And Try Again Today was, you know, sort of an anthem. Uh, I wrote the, the most of the lyrics on that one. And that's really an anthem to guys who go out there and try every day. For me, I, it was based on a musician friend of mine. And John had, you know, a similar, uh, similar story. So it's really about somebody who just gets up and tries it again today because if you're a lifer in this business if you're in the music business and it's because it's in your dna you have no choice so i want you, people at home to understand we have no choice uh, it's true it's that's what that's the threat i keep seeing with musicians there they can't survive without it you that's have exactly to play. right yeah. and, and it, it's a catch-22 because a lot of them can't survive with it either, which is really, I mean, that's just, that's the tortured artist to anyway. So that, that was the point of, of that song, try again today. And you try until, you know, so you can't try anymore. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then the two demos that are on there that sound different, um, where are you going now? And, uh, life goes on. Those were tracks that were that John and I played everything on. I, I played the guitars, he played some of the keyboards, we did the orchestrations together, he played bass, I did the drum parts. Um, because those were meant to be demos to be played for somebody else. In this case, uh, it was for The Who. But, um, so I included these, these two demos because they're not polished tracks they're really a represent uh, representation of how the song could go and it's indicative of what john thought we should present to uh pete and roger and uh so the two songs that were on there that are on there um are those i mean i i had a great mastering engineer stevie decutis who kind of brought them back you know because they were never like i said never meant to be released but how do you have something like that that's just doesn't ever see the light of day you have to 
you know, you have to give it some room. And I think John's fans, the, the, the ones that really loved what he did, would, would more enjoy the insight and the intention than they would criticize, well, you know, this doesn't sound like a whatever. So, yeah. and then the live tracks, uh, I picked those because of the, uh, they're all from the last tour that we did. And if I'm not mistaken, they're all from the last uh, show in New York City. Um, but I picked them because of the spontaneity of them. Um, with the, in the case of Shaken All Over, um, you know, I, I speak a lot about chemistry and telepathy. Uh, when uh, people ask me what it's like to play with John. And um, it really is. It's telepathic. You get to know somebody musically or in our case, it's almost like you've always known them and you can work together. You can't let all the other stuff get in the way. It's just you're playing music. You're two serious people going for a goal. And if you if it lines up, that's magic. So I think that's demonstrated quite a few times in the three tracks that I picked from the live shows. Um, we, we had a great keyboard player on the last tour, a guy named Chris Clark, fantastic. And he takes a solo in the beginning of Raging Moon. And um, so you had to, you know, had to give Chris his due. And then the funny thing about Shaking All Over is um, we used to just start that. I mean, we'd just start with the riff. Right? And so we we were in new york and it was the guitar player's home turf mine too but i mean you know so i said to john let's let him step out in the front of this one john you know said okay and so he starts to play the solo which you hear <laughs> on the record now i'm imagining that you would listen to that introduction and then the bass and drums kind of build up underneath it bow and you would say wow i wonder how long they rehearsed that None. What was happening was the guitar player was playing longer than John wanted him to play. And he comes over, comes over to the drums and he looks at me like, uh, gives me the eyebrows like, so I, <laughs> <laughs> so I looked over at him and I gave him this and we just started doing it. <laughs> It's the truth, man. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I have I have somewhere between 50, 60, and a hundred shows. We never did that before or since. <laughs> and so I thought it was necessary necessary to have that on there. And uh who left their phone in here? This needs to stop. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my god. Um, John calling in from beyond to have his commentary on this. Yeah, that's that's actually not his ringtone, but uh, his his ringtone is is thunder. Um, <laughs> yeah, a little bit more. But yeah, it, it certainly could. So anyway, I mean, that was the that was why that particular one. I mean, it, it's a pretty darn good bass solo as well, and um, and they all had that kind of that telepathy in them that one you know if you didn't see that show you didn't see that thing happen this is going to get thrown across the room now. um that's that's for john to do um so i i mean they all have i i wanted this album to be a bit of an adventure and i'll, I'll tell you how it how it came to be um i told you i'm doing a live stream and i i instead of well, it's kind of like this. I mean, it's you and I are just talking, telling stories, right? I mean, I'm telling more of them because it's supposed to be that way, but it's a conversation. It's not an interview and it feels like that. So I do a show based on that, which means I can call anybody in my phone book and it's not weird. You know, you call up Gerardo Velez after 30 years and say, hey man, how are you? It's like, what? But, um, but if, if you, invite them to be on a show and you reconnect live, which is how I do it. My, my showrunner will call my, uh, write to my friend, whoever it is and say, Hey, Steve's doing this. Would you like to do it? And then they say yes. And, and it's this. Um, so, uh, so I got, um, 
I got to reconnect or connect with a lot of people. I mean, you and I now, we're here, we have this, we can, you know, do whatever we want in the future. And so I happened to connect with a guy named Charlie Calve, who was the keyboard player for Angel, if you, you remember Angel. And they're still playing together. And Charlie's on the show. And, and I can't remember how I found out that he was involved in this label. But long story short, um, because of Charlie being on that show and me connecting with him and just uh, what I'm talking about, wound up realizing that Deco Entertainment is probably a good home for anything that I would want to do. And we, you know, we were just kind of shooting the crap, you know, how about this? How about that? You know, because I have all the projects that I did with, you know, with various people that either didn't come out or whatever happened. And I thought, you know, this would be a good home for some stuff. And we finally landed on the Entwistle catalog because I have, I mean, all of my involvement, I don't have the catalog going all the way back to his solo albums, but um, I have all of the material that was written back then that wasn't completed. And I, it's, I have tons of stuff because we exchanged our catalogs, for lack of a better word, so we could write together. Mm -hmm. So um, so I called Chris Entwistle, his son, up, and I said, hey, hey man, I'm going to do a rarities uh record with dad's you know some of dad's and mine stuff on it but i really need a good name i don't want it to just be john entwistle rarities and he without missing a beat man he said oxoomed and it was like how how entwistle is that <laughs> oxoomed and it's funny because i remember john naming the film that we were doing uh, uh, an ox's tail that it was it was just such an ant whistle perfect thing so i said that's great and then uh, being a uh, um you know having it called ox zoomed it's not something i would do myself without talking to chris first <laughs> yeah. but um once i had that green light i said oh let's go so then what do you do you exhume all of the things that are john entwistle from his entire life all over the cover of the record mm -hmm. and i've always liked hiding things or little puzzle stuff and john used to like that too you, you know hey did you see that oh no i didn't see that you know it, that kind of thing so i decided to make this um oxoomed i decided to, decided to oxoom as many things as i could from his winston 100s to his favorite movies and there's stuff scattered all over the place and uh and so i decided to, that i could carry that through into the material that i picked because there's little stuff in there I mean, you obviously uh caught the themes at the end of uh left for dead mm -hmm. um it's you know that it's it's john's sense his his kind of dark and spooky humor um comes out in just about everywhere so that's you know that's how this whole thing blossomed and of course before i did volume one i made sure that i had enough for volume two um at least volume two and and the the thing is i want to get the reaction from the people that are listening you know what do, would you want to hear more of there's not a lot more studio stuff because we only recorded so much stuff there are a lot of demos there are a lot of incomplete things and there are so many live shows we recorded every show so it's somewhere between 60 80 100 shows and most of them are very good quality so it depends on the feedback. If, if people want to hear more of the John Entwistle band performing live, well, I could, you know, I could do that for a long time. Because mm -hmm. um, there were nights where we played every song. You know, we used to, we used to routine uh, uh, the night, rehearse a whole book of songs. And then depending on how long we had to play, we, you know, I'd write the set based on that. And... We learned a bunch of, the last one we learned a bunch of stuff from Tommy and all this instrumental stuff. And um, by the end of the tour, we were playing everything. <laughs> and uh, he'd say, we're playing everything we know tonight. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of material is the point. And, um, you know, if it, finds a, if it finds a good home out there, then we're all happier for it. How much would he, like, just, I know for some reason Bruce Springsteen's coming to mind and 
as you say that of like, well, we're going to perform this and how Springsteen will just be like, we're doing these songs and you got to be ready for it. Was John Entwistle kind of like that? How did he take an approach to any given night's set list? Um, uh, he didn't. He he <laughs> he let me write that. I wrote the sets, and he it was he was the kind of guy. I know what you're asking me. Like, was he gonna? ask us to be ready for anything no never whatever was on the list that's what we were going to play um but i remember one night i forget where we were it doesn't matter really maybe chicago and we just started playing uh long live rock the piano player and the guitar player and and we just came in john and i just came in in the right place and we just played the song. We kept it in the set. No one ever even said anything. It's like, so, you know, he was, he was easy, man. He was just, he, he just wanted to play, wanted to play stuff that he liked, but you know, um, and, uh, yeah, he was, that's, yeah, he was, uh, ready for anything. He never asked for anything. It wasn't like, well, can we do this? I would have to prompt him for you know can we do success story do you want to do trick of the light um you know because if he had wanted to it never even occurred to me to do stuff from the solo albums in this particular band which in hindsight was a huge mistake because i went on to do a concert with uh the band that i was that i had formed after john called torque and we did a lot of that material and and we would have done it great but um you know, John, he, when I used to ask him to sing songs, Trick of the Light or Success Story or whatever, um, he tried, ah, 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 and then, you know, he'd say, ah, oh, they're not coming to hear me sing. Okay, we'll do it. He was a trooper, man. I mean, he was, he was a trooper. So he made it easy. No, no demands and, and anything that we wanted to do, or he, we just had the latitude to do it. I was, Fascinated watching the Boogeyman music video, it just got reposted, and suddenly comes in the part where it's the, I call it horn syncing to, of course, his vocal horn part, and you and the other guys in the John Entwistle band all playing horns, and I'm watching this, and then, like, what was it, you and keyboard player uh, St. John? Alan St. John, St. John to my left, and Godfrey Townsend on the right. other end. Right. Uh, to John's right, and they're giving this look of of like of you two are like mm, at the end. What do you recall of that? <laughs> Quite a bit, actually. Um, we had a video weekend. You know, we we uh, the label or the the I forget who sent it out, but somebody sent out a a video crew, right? Because we were going to do a music video to support the television show and. And they send this amazing crew and they all set up and there's a, uh, I mean, there's grips and there's everything that you would need, but no director. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, what are we going to do? Because we only have these guys for however many days it was. And John said, oh, I don't know. And I said, well, we can't, we're not set up to play. So I run up to my, my room and I draw up a storyboard for the bogeyman. And I bring it down and I say, let's do this, you know? And the th and so <laughs> um, if you notice, uh, it opens with the bogeyman jumping around. On, that's John's front yard, or not front yard. It's, you know, whatever that is from the driveway for a mile. And then inside the house, when the bogeyman is coming down the hallway, that's all smoked out. So we're smoking it. So, I mean, it was just crazy. So, um, so getting to the end part where the horns are, that story is uh, John, Keith, John and Keith had recorded the bass, the drums, and then John had overdubbed the vocals. And when he went back to do the horns, uh, he forgot, <laughs> forgot his horns. And so he did everything, you know, by mouth with the embouchure of his mouth as if he was actually playing those instruments. So when I heard that, I mean, it just sounds almost comical. I said, we really have to do this. And John had every brass instrument you can imagine. So we gave, so John wanted to play the, 
the trombone and we gave Alan the big whatever it was and I got the smallest little trombone. It was just meant to be <laughs> comical. And at the end when it's going, <laughs> John looks at the guitar player like, oh my God. And it was meant to be, you know, comic relief. So, so I am directing the video and I remember having a great idea that every time it goes back to the verse, bogeyman will get, uh, the bogeyman was supposed to come up and snap his fingers. There was supposed to be a flash and they got a couple of them right when they edited it. But uh, John's originally playing a gold Warwick bass. The bogeyman comes up and snaps his fingers and all of a sudden he's playing a Framus bass, which is not quite as good. And so as the bogeyman keeps coming up, every time the hook comes around, the bass gets worse and worse and worse. Yes. He's, play, he's playing a tiny little um, uh, Thunderbird bass, which he had made for his kid, and then the giant acoustic bass with the E on the top of it. And finally, in the last verse, when it says, I stayed up all night with a baseball bat, the bogeyman ain't going to get me. Um, you know, I figured he should be playing a baseball bat. <laughs> and... You don't even think about these things, but I'm, I'm, I said, do you have a baseball bat? Do you know what a baseball bat is? You know, because I'm not seeing you as, you know, hey, let me get my mitt and my ball, right? right. So, but, and I don't know what it was doing there, but uh, I, somebody <laughs> said, oh, I know where there's a baseball bat. And it was like, <laughs> okay. And boom. So we used that. And then the bogeyman comes in the end and gives him his gold base back. And it was just, man, it was just fun. It was like being little kids with a movie camera, um, just having fun. It was, it was amazing. As he said, the lunatic running the asylum. Mm -hmm. That's me. What, what's, your, what's the biggest thing you learned about, I don't know, music or life or both, if they're intertwined, from just working with him, being with him for 15 odd years? The biggest thing that I learned from being with him for 15 odd years, man, I mean, I would have to, I learned so much from him. He was eight years older than me, which is like my older brother in real life was eight years older than me or is eight years older than me. But, but I had the relationship with John that I maybe would have liked to have with my own real brother. It just didn't work out that way. And so the insight, the sharing, um, he was so generous with information, but he was equally um, as uh, receptive to any information that you might give him. So what was the biggest thing I learned? Jeez. Um, well, musically, I have a great story, and, and this song will be on volume two. There's a, a song that we did called Sometimes. And John and I wrote the track and, you know, I was done from my demo. So when, when you bring in a demo, we do it from your demo and we use as much of your stuff as we can. And, and so that was the case with this. And he helps me fill in the blanks and so on and so forth. So um, we're getting ready to record it. And he comes down with a, a like a, a composition pad, you know, with the, with the lines on it. And there are whole notes, music, you know, whole notes, six note chords written in eight bars. Mm -hmm. And he said, I thought of this before I went to sleep last night. It was like, what? So anyway, he puts the, the chords in front of the piano player, uh, the keyboard player, Alan, and, and he says, you know, play these chords. And Alan plays the first part and he goes, uh-huh, uh -huh. And he plays the second chord, uh-huh, uh -huh. and the third chord. And these chords are getting worse. It's like... I think he, I'm ready to say, are you playing a joke on me, man? Because I thought, and I was about to say, you know, that sounds like, but I didn't because it's John Entwistle. Man, you think you're the producer on the session, but you know, you're there to produce the best that people have to give. So I said, you know what? Don't, don't say a word. And I didn't. And everybody had their parts. And we did the chords. And when he added his bass part to the bottom of the chord, it was like, how did he think of that in his head? And, and this thought that I might have stifled that, unthinkable. So I learned the, the biggest 
thing I learned there was when you're working with someone, let them get their whole thought out because you never know what's in there that you might not initially understand. And the other thing that I learned from him real quick was I'm mixing the record one day with Bobby Pridden and he comes in and he says, you look troubled. And I said, yeah, I can't decide whether the bass is too loud or not. He said, no, turn it up, then you can be sure. <laughs> <laughs> these, these little ant whistleisms. There's just they're they're just scattered around. Was, was he that? I mean, I know people can sometimes get a little bit of a taste from interviews and such, but was that just like out of nowhere, bam, and like, well, yep, that makes it all that distilled right down to that, and that's the essence right there. Yes. Yeah, I mean Yes, like I said, he, he named the film. Uh, Chris named the the album. That's all Ant Whistle. It's it's, he, and I think it's one of the reasons that we got along because his his sense of humor was so specific and so dry and so so. Um, if you didn't get it, you didn't get it, and we just used to make each other laugh. the The way we became friends over time was after we had played the the first time together at the jam session in Chicago, he gave me his number and we stayed in touch. And John is, I wouldn't call him shy, but I would call him guarded. I mean, he loves people and he loves his fans more than I can ever explain, but he's not the kind of guy that's just gonna buddy up with somebody and start making phone calls and going to the movie. So um, we start, we were faxing jokes back and forth together and just making stuff up, just being silly. I mean, because, you know, you don't think of John Entwistle at three o'clock in the morning in England in some massive house wanting to have a laugh. You know what I mean? You think of him, you know, having a brandy or turning into bed or walking the wolfhounds. You don't think of him faxing jokes and drawings on a... I mean, and I think the fact that him being in The Who never came into our friendship. I mean, I, it just wasn't part of the equation. I mean, it was due to business and scheduling, but it wasn't like, hey, man, tell me, so, you know, I could care. We were, it was about going forward for him. It was about going forward for me. And that, I mean, of course, I heard more than my share of stories, but at him, you know, volunteering them, that's, you know, uh, it wasn't like, man, tell me the craziest thing that, you know, it was never based on that. It was, let's do our own crazy stuff. <laughs> Got like about five minutes before the Zoom runs out. So I'll ask you this. And this is going to be like the tough question to answer in a short amount of time. What would he be doing today? Were he here 20 years since his passing? Wow. Um, I don't know what he would be doing in this very day, except to say <laughs> something. But But in the 20 years, I know there would have been tons of music well i mean we discussed you know as friends we we taught we we weren't telling war stories we were you know talking about what we might like to do and i remember um when we started writing and i said you know what do you want to write and he said i want to write a car commercial and i'm thinking like uh, and what he meant obviously was like rock and roll from the cadillac commercials those years ago he meant really that he wanted to write a song that was so popular that it would find its way down to there. He, he didn't want to write, see the USA in a ship. Um, but uh, he would have been, I think, I think we'd, I think we'd still be touring. I think he would still want to play. I think, I, I'm sure that he would have been on all of the Who tours that were of late. So I, I think he would have done that. I'm sure he would have done that. If there was a place to play, he would play. Nothing got in his way. It was no politics there. Um, but I also think we would have been doing uh, soundtracks for motion pictures. That was our ultimate goal was to be able to, you know, kind of not a Danny Elfman per se, but to be able to transition um, into a serious uh, composing, even Trent Reznor has, has done it. So I think I know that's what we would have been doing because we loved playing around with it. And he gave me, that's also some of the things, he gave me all of his demo ideas with regard to soundtrack, you know, things that weren't rock and roll songs, things that weren't comedy songs. Um, these, uh, so 
you know, these just like a car chase or a mystery or, you know, mm-hmm. and they are so typically John that I can't help but, you know, figure that I have to figure out a way to get those out there because they're, you know, so. Yeah. Well, the good news is there's still more for us to listen to that we haven't heard before. We in the public haven't heard before and you're working on it. And that's great. Steve Longo, having put together John Ed Whistle Rarities, ox- ox- Oxumed, Volume 1, waiting for Volume 2. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for chatting. Thanks for this whole project and looking forward to more. And I can tell you, as one of these music geek types, anytime there are demos, we'll take them. Doesn't matter the artist. I, I want to hear more. Doesn't matter Excellent. the quality. Want to hear more. So, yes, bring it well, on. We, we, you know what? Like I said, we've got stuff coming at you, and um, I just have to pick the right things, which I will do, and they have to be worthy of John. And to that point, what John would be doing right now is helping me pick the song. So maybe I do know what he's doing today. <laughs> Perhaps you do. Awesome. Thank you for taking the time today to chat. All the best. Try to avoid uh, the Orion spacecraft as it comes back. to not hit the cupola in the background there. Could get yeah, a no, dicey. no. I, I, I've, you know, we've got the sensors out. I, I'm pretty well covered. And Luke, thank you very much. I should, or should I say Luke? Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Very appropriate. Awesome. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks, Stephen. All the best. Hey, thanks for getting the word out there, Luke, and we'll see you out there, man. Sounds good. Take care. Bye-bye.